Hello, everybody, and welcome back to this second day. Um, I, I thought we could start and just hear a little bit if you have experienced any problems yesterday after um, when working with Illustrator or just thought about things that you feel that you would really want to know today. And it would be great because we have some time in the end to be able to wrap up and I can take up some topics that we may not cover. So if any, anybody has sort of one thing that I feel would like to be covered, just let me know right now. No, maybe you'll know in the end of the day. So I'll, I'll ask you again. But so keep in mind if there are things that you think, well, this would be really know how to, uh, good how, how to know, how to do. Yes. It's very specific. Yeah. So if you have a consent line mm -hmm. and you want to take away part of it. Yes. So I can briefly show that to you. Um, it's a good sort of general thing to do. So. What, what you're uh, thinking about always w with lines and adjusting them is that you can not divide it in more pieces than you have anchor points. So if you have a, if we then start with a circle, that's the most easy one to understand. So when you have a circle, you can now take away different parts. So you can take away one qu quartile of this circle, for example, this part, because it sits between two anchor points. But that's not always what you want to do. You may want to take away smaller part. So what you need to do then is to add an anchor point to the place wh where you want to delete. So if I want to delete just this part here, I want to add an anchor point there. And to do that, in the pen tool up here, you have one that says add anchor point. So when you go with that one and you go back here, you can then add the anchor point exactly where you want to be able to take away the fraction between. And then you go back with the direct pointer and you can take away that one. Did that answer your question? Yeah, the only thing is that when I do that, it makes a new straight line in between instead. So instead of it being the bench line, it makes a straight Yes, that's a, a visual appearance. It doesn't do it but it may look like that. The reason why it looks like that is because you're looking at the filling of this. So if I go back and select this one and I fill it, you see now that it has filled with a straight line between those open ends. And it's because they are open ends. But if you have a line, it wouldn't fill that line in between. So it, it needs to fill something and then it just makes a straight line when it fills in between. It, it really shouldn't do that. It may be something else you have uh, in that specific drawing. It, it's easier if you show that file to me, I think, later on. Let's see if we can uh, help you get sorted with that. But normally, it should never fill when you take away the line in between two points. OK, so um, let's get back to the other things today. Today, I thought we will try to mix a little bit, not to make it too dry. So the, the program of the day is, so we'll uh, start in the morning to have quite a bit of discussions around how to get started. And to get started, you can, of course, have two different quests. One is to get all your data into Illustrator. And that will be the first discussion. How do we bring all of this together? And how do we maintain quality and editability of our files? The second thing we'll discuss in the morning is how do you get started from scratch when you want to draw something? And there, I, this is just my recommendations, how I do when I have a concept of something that I would like to draw. Um, and I'll just go through some basic tips on that one as well. And then after the coffee break, we'll have our guest, Annika Röll, who is in the back. She will present herself briefly when she starts. Um, and she'll take you up to lunch. And then in the uh, afternoon, we'll actually get more into InDesign as well, to look at how to bring the things you did in Illustrator into a composite in InDesign. And then Annika will continue with her second talk, and we'll end with a short part of uh, uh, the Swiss documentary about the font. And it's more exciting than it actually sounds, I think. But it's, it's a bit nerdy. But I, I think it's a good end of the day.
So uh, I hope you will enjoy that. So the, today we'll start with a very exciting topic, and that's file formats. Um, it's, it's very dry and boring, but I think it's, it's key to know how to get data into Illustrator to know the difference between different file formats. Um, so why do we have different file formats from the start? There, there are two reasons why these different files have come up. One is because there's always been a need to um, standardize things, to make files as small as possible, and to have other types of flexibility. So they, they have come up uh, in different places. The first file formats were just sorting uh, points in the matrix and describing them. And they were sort of not compressing anything, just keeping them uh, in, locked into that file. And these file formats are nowadays, the, the one that has survived is called TIFF. And TIFF you will see in many places as being sort of the basic uh, file format of choice. And TIFF is very good because it doesn't do anything with your data. It can maintain all quality in many aspects. And one aspect that I didn't take up yesterday, which I think I should have, is the bit depth of uh, images. So sometimes you see 8-bit uh, grayscale, 10-bit grayscale, 12-bit grayscale. And what does this actually mean? Well, it means that it divides this continuum into smaller and smaller blocks. So if you have a continuum from white to black, what was considered from the start uh, was that a sufficient amount of grays was 256. And 256 shades of gray is considered 8-bit. So when, when you add a bit, you double what you already had before. So if you have a 9-bit, it's then 512. Uh, it's, sorry, uh, 256 times 256, so that's uh, 36,000, sorry. Um, so you uh, go exponentially up. Um, and so what this means is that uh, then you have uh, now at that point made yourself a lot of more gray uh, values. What, why do you need more gray values than 256? Because the 256 grayscale looks really good and, it, and it's, it's perfectly sufficient for anything that you view. The problem is when you want to start to adjust this image data. So you have an uh, image where you only have your data within the light part. Say that it's a very overexposed image. So everything is, is sort of contained within the lighter half of your image. When you stretch that light half out, you have taken only 128 the shades of gray and made them into 256. So you don't have that data to make it into 256 when you stretch it. So the more bits you have in your color data, the more you can adjust your image afterwards without losing quality. And this came up in the afternoon because there was this question, why not take out your Western blot data from your Western blot machine and just uh, do all the adjustments in Photoshop? And the reason for this is to maintain the higher bit depth of your camera. Because these high quality CCDs cameras that we put into scientific uh, machinery are normally 10 or 14 grayscale bits. So, so while w if you do that adjustment within the software of your Western blot or if you're a microscope, you maintain that larger color space uh, with, with your adjustments. In many applications, you can nowadays export uh, higher bit rates than 8-bit grayscale. So that's, that's something that you want to look into because it's, it's great to have that extra color data. And that's very true for grayscale, but also for color uh, images. So color images, you have then three colors, and each of them are 8-bit. So you combine these into the 16.7 million colors. And those are then considered 24-bit color data. Would it make sense to convert the grayscale tip image to the higher bit number, that's 32? Which is then the same information that you have about the grayscale. Yeah, um, some software do, can do that. And it may or may not make a difference. Where it can make a difference, it's, it sounds a bit strange, but it's if you want to reduce the size of your image. 
because then you're increasing the bit uh, depth and then uh, when you reduce it maybe I should draw that if we have any uh, yeah so because if you would uh, increase it without any of um, um, any change in the image you would just if you have bars of grayscale like this you would uh, in principle just divide them into two so you wouldn't in induce any more information. But if you have something that where you have four pixels uh, next to each other uh, having different gray values, so this one may be lighter and this is white, and you merge all of them into one, then you have retained color value from this if you keep it into the 16 uh, bit. So it can be cases where it's actually good to increase bit depth if you're decreasing the size. It's a bit like binning in Western blots, that you're also taking more of these uh, um, photons and making them into one data point. So as soon as you combine these two, it makes sense. If you don't, then it doesn't really make sense to increase the bit depth. But it's always good to see, uh, especially on your microscopes when you're looking at this, if you can acquire images at a higher bit depth. Because that makes all this difference afterwards when you do um, change your images in, uh, with the w white balance and other things. And it's the same thing if you have your uh, personal digital camera. You have two file format options there. You have one that is uh, called the RAW file format and one that is JPEG. And I'll get back to the JPEG, but the RAW file format there also maintains this larger color space. So you can get that out into... 16-bit grayscale or 48-bit color information. So for color, it's the 48-bit that would be your uh, one of choice, if you can. Um, and historically, it has been a bit of a challenge to work with this higher bit depth data. That's why ma many applications export out the 8-bit by default. But now, if you see the whole uh, suite of uh, Adobe Suite, you, it handles higher bit depth all through. So you don't really notice it. So you can uh, uh, open them in Photoshop. You can um, uh, place them in, in design and print and do everything there. So now you can actually maintain that higher bit depth in your files all through. So that's the tip. If you can maintain those files uh, in high dip, bit depth, do. Because then you can, can go back if you need to. Um, to maintain something in a high bit depth, then you need to stay with TIFF. There, there are other file formats that can manage it, but it's not as well supported as doing it in TIFF. Um, so TIFF is uh, where I would suggest you maintain all your raw negatives of your files. And why not go to JPEG? Because JPEG can be opened in ev everything, and uh, they are small files, convenient to use. And the reason why you don't want to use that all through your workflow is because it has what's called destructive uh, compression techniques. And it does uh, this by studying how we view images and where we perceive information. And we see information mainly within the gray, uh, green values of an image, because that's where uh, all our uh, rods in the um, eye can have most energy to see. So all the rods are uh, helping to give the, that uh, bit uh, detail of images. The cones give you the color, but they are much less exact. And um, so you want to make sure that your um, structural information is in green. And these JPEGs do that as well. And then when it goes to the fringes, when you go to blue and red, it makes the detail much less uh, informative. So if you uh, take a JPEG image and you split the channels and look at blue and, uh, and red, the quality of those channels is much, much worse than the quality in green. And that can be very bad if you're working with confocal images where uh, all of the channels are equally important. Um, the other thing with destructive compression, it's similar to the MP3s that we download and put on our players and phones. And they are very small. But you get rid of a lot of information that you can never get back. And this is not a one-step process. It actually gets rid of information every time you save a JPEG after modification. 
So say that you take a, a confocal image, you save it as a JPEG, you open it in Photoshop, do some cropping. Just you don't change anything in each pixel, but you do cropping and save it again. It actually makes that image per pixel within the cropped area worse off than it was before you resaved it. Because it sort of it, uh, translates from it into uh, uncompressed format, changes, and compresses again. But then it sees it as a new image, and it compresses in another way. So just by opening, doing a small modification, saving in JPEG, and recycling that, your image will degrade gradually over time to be actually very bad quality in the end. So to not have that worry, you want to make sure that you use non-destructive compression techniques early on. So fortunately, there are non-destructive compression techniques. And the one you want to look for is called LZW. And the LZW is uh, similar to, if you think about the example yesterday I gave with the fonts and the lookup of a font. The LZW does the same thing, but it looks at code fractions and say, well, this code fraction is identical to that guy. We'll call those A. And then it stores it as, as A and then gives reference to those. And that can be very efficient if you have, for example, a large black area in your image. Because it just says, all of this is black. And then it's done with it. And, uh, so, and Or white, or anything like that. As soon as you have large areas of an image that are like this, um, that have a lot of repeated values, then it, it's great for compression of that. So for example, if you have your confocal image and only um, information in the green channel, nothing in red and blue. A normal TIFF without compression would save all the data in green and blue as well. So all your TIFF files would have the same size. If you add the LZW compression to the TIFF files, then all your files will be different in size. Even though they were uh, captured with the same camera, they will have variable size. And the size will then uh, depend on how complex the image is. So a totally random image that's generated normally through so computer-based randomness would not be able to be compressed at all with that software. But in a JPEG, that image can still be compressed, but it uh, will deteriorate with time. So try to maintain your data in TIFF, if at all possible, and add this LCW. That's, that's the main tip. But uh, JPEGs are not, uh, it's not a bad file format. This actually makes images very small and uh, uh, handy. So it's a good tool at the end of your state, uh, of your modifications. So once you have come to a finished uh, image and you make it into a PDF, the, the images that you put into that PDF, those pixel-based graphics, can still be JPEGs. And it can look very good, because it's a single time you make this compression, and then it works well. But along the way, don't use the JPEGs, but use the TIFF file format. That's, that's where I want to go with the pixel-based graphics. So that, that's the file format to look for when you see uh, uh, data that has to be pixel-based. And when do we need data to actually be pixel-based? So you, sometimes you see in your software of analysis that a lot of it exports as TIFF just by random events. And I'll show you one example of that today, that it looks like this has to be pixel-based data, but it actually is vector-based. One place, so there are two places where we have conflicts in this. And I'll just take those two, because I know some of you are working in flow cytometry. So in flow cytometry, you have a data set being built up of points that you scatter. And these scatter plots are in themselves vector-based data, because you know their coordinates, and they just make uh, artificial sites of each dot. But these can be 10,000 dots, a million dots, whatever. Um, and then it comes to a point where the complexity of maintaining vector graphics from such a plot becomes much more complex than it's worthwhile for you to maintain it. Because you don't want to go in and move all of these scatter dots on your um, flow cytometry data anyway. You want to maintain them at, as that cluster. So there it has been the trade-off that you make it into 
a vector, uh, pixel-based graphics, even though the original data is vector graphics. The other one is when you have too many, uh, too high frequency measurement data in, in your data. For example, if you're doing um, voltammetric recordings, anything over a long time, where you really do sort of high readouts. If you maintain all of these data points and try to sort of condense it down, you may end up with so many data points that it, it may then be difficult to work with. But often you want to, but you have to always see where are these lines crossing? When does it come non-beneficial for you to maintain that? And then uh, you can get around it by binning data into longer time periods, get rid of noise that way, and then you may be able to export it as vector graphics. But, but there are these two examples I see in, in our sort of often used data that can be a problem. But otherwise, mo many, much data can be into vector graphics, and more and more are trying to push that way. So then if we think about vector graphic file formats. I, I took that a little bit yesterday with the PDF file, the uh, AI file, and the PostScript files. There's just one file format left that I didn't uh, bring up yesterday, and it's one called SVG. And SVG is a f f vector-based file format as well, but it's uh, called scalable vector graphics, which is sort of a, a redundant term because all vector graphics are scalable intrinsically, but it's, it's meant to be for the web. So it's uh, the equivalent of JPEGs, but for vector graphics. So you may actually see that uh, the place where you will see it is if you download a drawing from Wikipedia. Um, and then that it's their file format of choice for their drawings. And so the SVG files are actually very good because you can import them in Illustrator as well and do whatever you want with them. So SVG is also a good file format to look out for. So those are the ones that you really want to uh, try to get your data out from your applications and into where you're working. The issue when, it, when working with these file formats is that not all suppliers do the job equally well to export into these files. And that's where I actually want to start today by showing two functions in Illustrator that you don't want to use. Um, and that's sort of a strange way of doing it, but it's important to know these, um, these two functions before you start to import data into, um, into Illustrator. What this uh, data or the applications normally do when they try to export something is export for a printer. And when it exports for a printer, it doesn't really care that you can edit your data in a good way. And what, what it may do then is to put in a lot of extra things, boundaries and a lot of empty <coughs> shapes that are disturbing you when you want to edit it later on. And the first example I will actually show is going back to my classical B character, just to keep this in some kind of continuity. So when you have a shape like a B, you have a quite complex shape. Because you have here, if we go into this one, and I can go to type and create outlines. And then I'll see the exact shape of a B. So when you have something, a shape like this B, you see that you actually have three different shapes. You have the outer boundary of the B and the two inner boundaries. How does this uh, application know that these are joined together? And they are not grouped. This is not a group, and it doesn't know that it's only between those that it should be filled and not, nothing else. What this is instead is something called a compound path. And the compound path is built up of two or more distinct paths. And for example, to generate that, if you have this star here and you make a circle inside that, and we'll just flip the coloring here so it can be more. So, 
So we can have these in different colors. So you have now these two uh, shapes. And if I select both of them and go to path and say, sorry, here, compound path make. Now you see that the one on top is sort of punched out of the one below. And it makes this in multiple levels as well. So if you put a third shape on top of this and make that one bluish one. And you now see you have three levels. Then it will make the same thing as um, plus, minus, plus. So it goes m minus one for every one that goes above. So you see where there's nothing below in here, it will be a black. And then here, because it's only two layers, it would be empty. And then three layers black again. So this is not now black and white. It's actually black and nothing. So if I would put uh, this other shape below, you will see that it's, it's a transparent one. So you now have this shape like this. Um, that can be useful to, uh, in some places, but the Pathfinder is much easier to work with. And what the good thing with this is that it's a live data set. So if you double cl click into this, uh, it, it still retains the uh, square that I have here. Um, and then you can move these things around. And that's very different compared to if you work with Pathfinder. Then it creates all the outlines, and they are not their original primitive shapes. But why I bring this up is because this is something you will see a lot when importing PDF files into InDesign. Everything will become into a lot of compound paths. And that can be quite annoying to work with, and you can release these. But you, you can only release compound paths to a certain level. So what do I mean with release? Well, if I take this uh, one here and I go to Object, Compound Path, Release, I bring back all the three individual objects again. But you see the visual appearance changes. And that's where you need to be uh, observant here. Because if I take a B like this, um, and I release the compound path, I lose my B. So you want to make sure that you release the compound paths that you need, but not all of them. And that's really where it becomes a little bit tricky to work with um, PDF sometimes, because it brings a lot of that in. And I'll show you some examples of that. The other thing you will see in PDF files that is very common is clipping masks. And a clipping mask mask, what that is, is here again, if I have these two shapes, you have the front circle here um, can become my clipping mask. And so you select those two, you go to object, clipping mask, and make. So then it just clips the background object to the front object, and it just shows it through that sort of keyhole thing. And that's quite useful uh, in some places, but it's also misused a lot in these exported file formats. So what you do there is, again, that you want to release clipping mask. And that you do in the same object. Sorry, you need to select that. So you see here that it still has so this, the full star is still there in shape, but it's just masked for your view. So when you release this clipping mask, you will see that full object again. And so I can show you a good example of where this is an issue. And that's uh, when you want to start to get your data in, into um, Illustrator. And let me go into here and just show you one place where I prefer to do my graphs. And that's in SPSS. I don't know if many of you consider SPSS a graph drawing software. And many just use it to visualize your data, and then you go somewhere else to draw your graphs. And the main reason is that they are not very attractive, um, these graphs.
but they, it's actually very feasible to use to uh, generate quite good graphs as a base in, basis for Illustrator. So if we just have this very simple data set, and I'll make a scatter plot just to show you here, make a time variable versus another variable. And I think we want to take a mean value actually here. So the nice thing with doing it in SPSS is that it generates your uh, standard errors already uh, without having to calculate them. So when you get the graph there, you can then do the small additions that you want to do, for example, in this time curve analysis, and have something that you're happy with. Um, in uh, SPSS, you now will see when I try to export this graph that you have two different options. And this is uh, one take home message that you do want when you start with a new application and getting it into Illustrator, you want to evaluate which of those two options is your best. And there's no single answer to this. So in here you see that uh, you have either the PDF version to export or you can go to actually have um, graphics only and go to encapsulated PostScript. And this is the file format I me mentioned yesterday that is the file format where it's sort of a cut down PDF with easier to uh, <coughs> modify data in it. The risk with EPS in some applications is that it gets rid of your fonts as well. And so it, it makes outlines of every type that you've made. And for a graph, that could be a, a nuisance because you want to be able to edit all, all your data sets. So that, that may be places where you don't like the EPS file format. But I'll show you in SPSS that there actually the EPS is your uh, do, um, file format of choice. Because if you export it as a PDF, So now I have created a PDF, and you see it now has a full page. It puts it on a page just as if it would print it. And this is very common in many applications, that you see uh, things like the page number down here, and that is a full A4. When you choose to open this in Illustrator, you have two different options. I'll show you the most straightforward, and that's just to either drag it to the icon, cho chose open in the Illustrator, or open from the open command. And then it opens th this PDF file. And as you see now, it still looks identical as when you open it in the PDF viewer. But if I select all objects on this, you only have a single object. And if I move it out like this, you now see that it has made a white box below and it all is in one. But this, this is still vector graphics and there are still all these objects within it. So what it has done is to make an outline of the full A4 page. And when you go to then to object, you see that you now have um, in your compound path, you, it has made this into compound paths. And it has also made clipping masks. So what you want to do is, in this order, try to always get rid of all clipping masks first. So you start by releasing clipping masks. And you will see that you have a short command. And you see now that I've released two clipping masks, all these objects are starting to appear. And you can continue with that until you have Sorry, that was a compound path. But uh, the, the clipping masks, until you have released all your objects like this. Then you will see that you can now go in and select each of these individual objects. What you want to do then is, you see, it has all of these frames here. And many of them 
have either a black line or, in this case, nothing in them. So they are just empty objects, but they are annoying for you. Then there is a very nice feature in Ill Illustrator, and that what you do is to select everything. So you can do, I think there could be a command here. No, but if you have Command or Control A, you select all objects in your file. And then in <coughs> your object and path, you have something called cleanup. And what the cleanup does is that you can see here that it takes away all stray points, all unpainted objects, meaning that it doesn't have either a, a outline, a stroke, or a filling. And you have these empty text paths. And if I take that, I now have taken away all of these extra objects. So there are no of these ex extra uh, frames in here. And it starts to become much more easy to work with. So with that, I can now start to just select those objects that I really don't want. And I can go in and start to adjust this in the way that I would like to use it. So then I can take away backgrounds like this, take away that white one, take away this frame, and so forth. So you can make this really into exactly what you want. And it's much quicker to do this in Illustrator than it would be in SPSS itself. But it has a very good basis for you to, so to you start working. Exactly just empty it removes empty, yeah. And uh, so uh, if you make a box that doesn't have a stroke color or a filling, that would be considered an empty okay. object. But that's not visible uh, normally. They, they uh, exactly, they are not visible printed. That's why they don't take them away. So all these boxes you saw there are when uh, SPSS wants to put in extra headers and other things, it's, or footers. They are just put there as convenience for SPSS. So this is where we are sort of working against what the original thought with this uh, file export was, because it was probably just to, to print and forget. So that's where uh, you have all of this cleanup necessary. In SPSS, fortunately, you have also this alternative approach that I said that you can here go in and say that you want to have only export the graphics and do the PostScript EPS here. And when you do that, it becomes much easier for you to work with. So when you look at the same EPS um, in now a PDF viewer, you see that it has made some quite big difference compared to when you export it as a PDF. It now doesn't have an A4. It doesn't actually maintain your font because they are not located within the PDF. So it changed them into a generic font in this case. And other things are now easier to uh, modify, but have changed a bit more. So these things are different in different applications. But if I just look at this EPS exported from, um, from SPSS, it's much cleaner already from the start. You don't have these stray objects. So in SPSS, it's quite clear that the best uh, format for you to export is EPS. But I'll show you later on that in PRISM, for example, it's worse to export it as EPS than PDF. So there, there are these two things that you need to look specifically in that application, which one you would prefer. And when I just have these type of things uh, online, one thing that I would recommend you to use when you're working with this type of data is a specific transformation tool. So if I just ungroup this and make it so that I can clean up things here. One, one challenge you have in um, SPSS data is that your error bars are always symmetrical um, on both top and bottom. And when you want to uh, export this, you, because they are uh, the same size, when you use standard error or standard error of the mean, you may want to have them unidirectional. And there are many ways to do this. So one is that you can go in to each of these and say that I want to transform from the bottom here and make the height always 50%. 
and I can go in and do this for each one of those, which is quite a pain. So the other alternative that you have is that you can select all of the ones where you want to have it going below, which could mean this case as well. And then I go into Object Transform and Transform Each. And what does Transform Each mean? Well, it means that it's transformed in relationship to its own location. So to compare this Transform Each to if you would just transform them as they are here, and I would go with the same thing. I have the reference bottom, and I have the height of these to be 50%. When it's, uh, sorry, it shouldn't be linked here to show you that. Um, so I if you take them as a group and transform them, they are moved. So then they are useless as your error bars. But going back to transform each, then you can actually make this so that it's the reference in the bottom here and your uh, vertical scale is 50%. So what I've now done is to maintain the size of the arrow bars down, but they are uh, the same size, just unidirectional. This tool is very useful also if I want to change proportion on my graph. So if I want to uh, shrink this in width, to make it more compact. What I would do is to select only the, sorry, the, these guys should be with, but not on the other side. Um, and I select not these guys here. So I just have this box, and I want to change the width of this. What I want to do is to maintain my reference to the left, and I want to make my width, say that I want to make this 75% of my original width. So when I've s uh, changed this to 75%, you see that what I have the, made the error now is that my circles here are no, no longer uh, round. And uh, fortunately here, these are grouped into one, and you can select all these three. And what I want to do here is to show you first one other feature that is available in all uh, Adobe software, and that is layers. So in layers, you can make new layers where you can move things to. And that's the same thing in I Illustrator, that you can make a new layer here. I'll just make this into something visible, hopefully. Um, so I've made a new layer, and I can right-click on these, go to Arrange, and say Send to Current Layer. Then I've made it so that I can hide the what's behind it, and you only have these data points here. The advantage with that is that I can lock the background layer, and I can now select only all these data points, and then I can ungroup these, or release the compound path in this case. So then you have all these individual data points. And you know now that, that I've scaled the widths to 75%. So then I can select all of these, go to a rain, uh, transform, transform each, and so I know my vertical one is 100% divided by 0 0.75, because that's the scaling I did on the other way. And then I go back here, oh sorry, it should have been horizontal, of course. So because it was in the horizontal axis, uh, axis I scaled. So it's 100 divided by 0 0.75%. And then they're back to perfectly circular. So you can save a lot of time by doing this if you want to sort of rescale graphs that you have in an editing mode. So th these are the things I want to just to show how you can get it out of SPSS and work with that. Other applications may not be as trivial. and one that uh, many people use is the PRISM application. So I thought I'll just show you the example from that. So PRISM is nice because it enables you to do graphs that uh, are quite difficult to do in other types of application. Like this dual axis error bars are not uh, simple to make in SPSS. So there are clearly cases where you need to do this 
kind of thing within uh, PRISM. When you export in PRISM, you have the option, let's see here, if you have the export, you have your EPS as well. And if you do the EPS export, you will see that there comes an, uh, an issue here. So let's just move that to the desktop and open this data. And the issue is not that it doesn't look good. It actually looks perfectly fine here. But if you try to select the different objects, you see that all your text has become outlines. So th then you cannot go in and edit if you want to have uh, change what's on my y-axis or anything else in the text there. You have to rewrite that. So that's something to spot when you're exporting EPS files, that it may uh, have this thing that it outlines your text. I'll show you another example where this actually is a necessity later on. But if you can avoid it, it's much easier when you want to work with your original data. So when you see that kind of thing, my recommendation is that you try and export it then as a PDF instead. Because the PDFs have the fonts built in, the applications are much more prone to include text as editable objects. So when you do that instead, you will see the comparison in Illustrator is the same file. It looks roughly the same, although it's cropped a little bit more heavily. But your text is now editable text. So then you can say. So you can now change this easily. And uh, so that's clearly an advantage when you want to work with graphs to maintain text as ed editable objects. Yes? Do you always save your um, graph or export it? You save it as a um, file form. I usually just copy paste. Yes. So the risk with copy pasting is that you will not get it as a vector graphics. It normally will not give you that. Uh, option. It may, and in some cases it works. It's, it's, uh, it's a bit more random the way it works with copy-paste. But I would never copy-paste it into an application where I can't see the result of the paste. So I wouldn't paste it into InDesign directly. I would paste it into Illustrator. And if that works and you have good objects there, then that's perfect. Then you really don't need this uh, to export the other way. Uh, so that is clearly another good option in, in some cases. So these are sort of obvious uh, applications where this works. I, I also wanted to show to everybody, th those that missed it that I took up in the afternoon, is what to do in applications that don't support uh, exporting as PDFs or EPS mm -hmm. files, and where you can't copy it and maintain vector quality. Um, on the Mac side, you have this in a very easy uh, access place and that's in your print dialog so we can just take anything like this if we take the uh, uh, LU homepage and you want to export this as a vector or a graphics with of course some pixel based graphics in it there is no way in in your uh, web browser to save this as a PDF but what you have in your print dialog is always the option to print as a PDF and this is only true on the Mac, that it's always available. I, on the PC, you have two different options. One is to install the Acrobat and its professional version, and you will gain access to print as a PDF. The other option I'll show you a little bit later is just a free tool that uh, enables you to do this on computers where you don't have Acrobat. So here you just save this page as a PDF, and you can uh, just again put it on the desktop. And then you will be able to open this text also in, um, in Illustrator. And then you can actually go in here and you see that your text is maintained and you can edit that. So most applications you can get, get PDFs out and work with them in many ways. Of course, for a web, it then makes it into the printable version and then makes it into a PDF. So it will not look identical to what's on the web page. Um, so in Windows, you have, of course, this challenge that it isn't built in from the start. But there, is a, there are many different versions. But the one that I like that hasn't a lot of 
what we consider crapware and these extra ads and things is called Primo PDF. And this Primo PDF is a small software that you can download for free. So when can that be useful? Well, for example, if we just go to uh, a data file and I say that I have uh, data from my QPCR. I took this example yesterday, so many have seen it. But in here, this software is limited in its export uh, potential. So you see that this is clearly vector-based graphics. You have a lot of measurement points all along this readout of your PCR reaction. But when you want to export it, it does only have save image as all of these pixel-based uh, graphic formats. So you have your JPEGs, you have your TIFF, and these other web-based, uh, uh, web-aimed file formats. But all of them are very destructive to your data. So if I would save it as a TIFF, because that's the best pixel-based version you can go, um, and just let me go to, uh, and if we just view that TIFF that's exported, you will easily see why this can, can become an, a limitation. So this is now your TIFF that's out there. And you see that it has a very sort of low resolution. You see all of these pixels everywhere. And if I want to get rid of the grid in the background here, it's not very easy to do that, because you will have to go in in your Photoshop and clean that out. So there are other alternatives then. What you can do is to use this. Uh -huh. Ah, it's here. Uh, use the function to print. So what I then do is just to select this and choose print. And in my print dialog, I now have a virtual pr printer. And this virtual printer is called this Primo PDF. So then it, uh, the software thinks that it prints, but it actually is printing to a software that genera generates this into a PDF file. And then I can save this in the exact same place and just call this the the Primo PDF. And then if I open that up in the same application here, you see that this is now looks very different. You have maintained all your measurement points are here. And your background pixels are then uh, available for you to modify. So then this file you can then open into Illustrator and you can clean it up and scale it exactly in the way you want. However, when you open this into Illustrator, you get a bad surprise. And this bad surprise isn't that uncommon. You can see this if you would open a PDF from your articles as well. There is a way around this to maintain all of this uh, font. So what, what this means is that it just uses a special font that you don't have available on your computer. And that's also very true for articles from uh, yeah, most of the publishers. They use their own specific fonts that are locked and contained in your PDF files in a way that you can not get them out here. But the trick is to use another way of placing your file. And this is a little bit more complex, but if you just follow the uh, steps, I think it will be quite clear. So what you have is a white page. You need to have a white document first, and then you go into place. And placing a file is uh, giving you the option to make a reference to a file. So it's actually not in importing all objects in here. So if I just bring back my Primo PDF example, it just puts this as a link to that whole object. And you see this crossover, meaning that it's just a reference to that PDF file. And then it maintains, you see the look, and the type is still there. But of course, you want to go in and uh, modify these objects. So what you can do then is to go into Object and uh, Flatten Transparency. And that's a very strange tool to use. In my view, you should have had the option in the place command to do this, but it isn't available there. So this is the way around it, that you go into flattened transparency. And then you want to make sure that what's flattened in this is maintained at 100% vectors. And you want to make sure that your text is converted to outlines 
and the strokes are not outlined. So change those two things. What that means is that it takes the part of your PDF file with the, the font in and can make that into the object that looks the same as the font. In this case, you will lose the ability to edit the text, but it will look uh, e exactly as it was in the beginning. So when you say OK then, then you get this object in and we can ungroup it and we can then release the clipping mask. So now we have our fully editable object with the fonts in here and I can then go in and change, for example, the grayscale of the or the appearance of each of these lines. So I can now make them into light gray and do all of these modifications that I would want to do on that data. So are you now changing the original? Now I'm changing the original. So once you have flattened the transparency, it's into this document. But, but the linking is gone. So uh, yes, you're uh, changing it, but you're not changing that original PDF file. So my, my answer should have been no. Yes, I can. So you start with the empty page. That's important. The second thing you do is to use the place command. So that's where you have the reference to a file. And you want to make sure when you place that you have the link pressed here. If this one is not clicked, it will try to open the file and put it in. And then you will have the same problem with the fonts as you had originally. But if you use the link command there and place it, here I just select which page you want to place. And then you get it in with the right fonts in. And then you go to Object, Flatten Transparency. And that's where you want to make sure that your text is converted to outlines. No strokes are converted to outlines, but your vectors are maintained at 100%. So it doesn't do any pixel-based graphics out of this. It, it's all vectors. And then you say OK. This will be available also on the streaming version. So you can check that. So these are sort of the key things to getting data into Illustrator. It's trying to maintain as much information as you can. And it, it often means all of these sort of a bit of ugly hacks, because there are no not perfect export options. But some places there are, and then just use those. But in many cases, it's possible to rescue like this. So next, I want to start discussing on how can we get our data into Illustrator. And that's where a lot of personal preference comes in. And uh, uh, you will build up your own preference uh, w when working with Illustrator. But what I consider when I do a type of sort of a uh, overview image for a V view or something like that is that, that I want to get a first sort of rough uh, view on how this can look, how the disposition can be, how different shapes come together. And that's very difficult to do in Illustrator. There are no really good ways of, of doing this sort of creative first step. So then you come into two different options. And the original option that I uh, tend to use just to start sketching on a piece of paper. Because just doing a, a by hand sketching, you will get all of these things naturally flowing. And it's much easier to uh, sort of get rid of uh, all of the things you didn't like in shapes. And, and it makes you to simplify your uh, data. And I would recommend you to do that, that you start just with a blank piece of sh uh, paper and, and just draw something very crude. So this was just an example of something that I, I used for a grant application a couple of weeks ago. And I wanted just to make a small uh, neuro neuronal network. So this is just a, a tiny cholinergic interneuron, which are normally huge, but uh, that is interacting with a lot of other neurons. And I wanted to see that I could fit it, this into a small place. So that's where I wanted to draw something that it just gives me sort of the shapes. Nothing of uh, where different uh, data points should be, where text should be, nothing like that. Those things are trivial to put in later on. But just to get which shapes are there, what sort of 
geometric uh, shapes will I use? Where can I see that I can actually reuse a shape? So you may see that, well, these spines, they can actually be uh, the similar ones. And when you start to see which ones can be similar and copy-pasted, you can make an image that's much easier to grasp for the eye because it keeps that uh, s uh, symmetry and other uh, things that are crucial for you to experience this as a simple image. So I think the more you sort of sketch on paper, the easier it is for you to uh, later on make this into a simple and visually clear picture. So then, how to get an uh, image into Illustrator? The best way today is actually to use the copiers that we all have out in our corridors. Because you can scan it there and send it via email. So you can just, this was scanned there and sent to me via email. And what I prefer to use then is just this black and white, what's called bitmap graphics, that doesn't maintain any grayscales, nothing like that. So it's just a, a very crude scan of this image. And that's another thing that I think is important. When I draw these type of things, I always work on much larger scale. So you don't try to draw your image in the size that you want it to end up in, but really sort of draw it big. Because you can draw it big for a long time in Illustrator and then reduce it down to the size where you want it. And that really makes it easier to get all these details right, I think. So that's a, another trick, is that this was just drawn on a full A4 first, and then I reduced it down. So once you have it in, then you can go into Illustrator. And in Illustrator, so I'll just skip that one and start with a new. So you start with a new page. And here again, you can choose if you want to work with this with CMYK or RGB. In this case, I think I continued on CMYK just for old habit, but you can just as well work in RGB. And now we're using the place command again. So then you can use on file and place, and you can find this uh, scan that I did. So then I place this, and it just uh, now fits the full page because it was from an A4. And if you want to work with that full A4, you can. But of course, you can also just scale it down to something that fits in the middle of your page. When drawing on top of something like this, it's annoying to have this uh, as something that you can move around. Because now, as soon as I uh, put in my pointer over here, it will try to move this background. So if I uh, miss a little bit and moving something else, I will then move the background. So here, you can again go back to your layers. So what I do then is to make a new layer, which will be my tracing layer. And you can just have any uh, color that you would like for that layer. So once you have that, you can then go back and lock the background layer. And then you have it like this. What the other option you can do is that you can now, let's see where that was. I just forgot how to bring that up. And many of these tools are hidden. So when you have images in a layer like this, you can double click on this image. And you get this up again where you switch the color of things that are selected. And then you can dim your images here. So I, I just dim all the images in that one to 50%. And it sort of grays it out, and it's easier to trace up on that. So now you have created a quite simple tracing background. You can easily, by uh, clicking this eye, you can get rid of the background. And you can now move and touch everything here without changing that background. So that's normally a quite good start. The next thing is to think about your shapes and think about <laughs> Where do I want to start to draw on this? And some shapes you may see, like this interneuron here, is just a question of, of uh, making anchors and draw around. But other places you see that you have the potential of making things easier for yourself. For example, in this one here, I made it into uh, the same thickness all through and a straight line. So there you have the potential to use just lines and create that into outlines. So I can show you these two examples. And then 
Here you see that you can make spines that you can copy and paste and then add on top of your dendrites. So when you want to start, of course then this is where it, it really comes to just spending some time to get used to this. And there are no quick tools to enable you to do this. But you start with a pen tool and you select your new layer. And then you have the option of putting in points. So you know that a circle can be made out of four points. So in a circle, you don't need to add more than four points. And it's easy when you start to uh, sketch these things that you just add a lot of points or anchors with, uh, that are making it too complex for you. And why I, I say that it's difficult to have too many anchors is that it's difficult to get clean and soft shapes if you have too many anchors because all of these points that you pull out are in relationship to each other. So if you pull one, the other one will go the other way and you will end up with uh, very wobbly shapes that are sort of uh, structurally very fragile. But if you have few points, uh, large handles on them, it will be very robust for you. So try when you draw to make as few of these uh, handles and anchors as you can. So what you always try to do is to maintain this as uh, the de derived slope at each place. So here I would try to pull this out. This is by prior knowledge how far you want to pull these out and where you want to put them. But normally you want to put them where you have slope shifts. So you see that this is a, a convex here and then it goes to a concave shape. And then where this sort of switches, that's probably where you want the next one. And then the third one you want to put here. And by pulling those out, you can then start now to build up a shape that can look roughly like what you had before. And then I put the next one up here, the th next one here, and so forth, and here again. You see, all through this one I don't need extra points, and here I don't need extra points, because shapes are not shifting. And here I put one, and a new one down here, and a new one up here, and so forth. So you build up this gradually with all these handles and anchors, and on this side, you can get around just having one anchor because this side is like a, a, a circle. So then you can get r around that. And then you see that you end up here and it goes to around again. And then you pull this out. So just by these points, how many can be? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. You can make a quite complex shape. And it doesn't need to look perfect at this first point. That's that's the key thing you need to think about, that when doing this first drawing, th things can really l look uh, quite awful. And, and don't bother with that, because you can always go back, and that's the beauty of this, that now I just make this transparent so you see it like this. Now I can go in and say, well, here, I don't like how that one was pulled. I want to have this sort of a more of a sharper um, synapse here. And then this one I want to move out like this. And this is where some people say fun, others uh, say that's a waste of time, but you can actually spend how little and how, how much time you want on this. And that's, of course, up to your own ambition and where this is supposed to be. Uh, if it's uh, the cover of nature, you may want to spend more time than if you're making a progress report on your grant. But that's uh, where these things can uh, be sort of fun and uh, creative. What this forces you is also to, to, again, simplify the shape. You can see that, well, the thing I drew was uh, unnecessarily complex. So I can now uh, take away some of these things. And you can now hide the background, and you just see this sort of amorphous interneuron that I made there. So that's, that's one of the parts that I want to say just by sort of sketching. Uh, you can uh, get a feel for this. The other thing is to really use shapes and uh, parts in your figure that are easy to use, uh, do. So for example, in this long axon here, I may want to just create this as a thick line. So what you do then is to, again, as I said, look at where things are changing from one to another and go up here. So here I make something that looks 
roughly the shape that I want. And for me, it's important that this one handle goes straight down because I want it to slip into the other axon. So here I see that I haven't drawn it actually in the way that I want it to feel in the end. So then I uh, get away from my original drawing. And that's perfectly fine because the drawing is just your recommendation. You don't want that to lock you into your shapes. And once you're done with that, you can now make this into a very thick line. So you have your line tool and you can make this into a line that fits the thickness of this axon. And in this case, it's six points. However, I don't want this to be a line only because I want to have filling and I want this to be merged with other things. Then there's the tool in object. You go to path and you outline your stroke. So what it then does is that it considers this stroke as a full shape and it now makes this into an outline. And then I can make this into black and white again. And then it's made it into this uh, perfectly um, equally thick axon all through. And this is much more difficult if you would try to trace the outlines of it because the thickness you would have varying over this whole part. So this can now become a first uh, path and then you can do the same thing for your uh, axon going down and you see here I want this then to be perfectly straight and have this as you said we said six points and you want these to be aligned Whoa. Interesting. That's not what I want. So here you clearly see the problem with having a thick stroke like this one. Should have aligned this earlier on before I did the outline of the stroke. I was a bit quick on that. So what you, what you do is just to uh, make outline of the second stroke again and you should have two paths that are looking the same. So now I should be able to do that same alignment and just to make as you remember before it's the one that's most to the right that will be the alignment here. So then I have these two together and I can go into my pathfinder and fuse them into one. So then I've created roughly the shape I was um, after initially, but I know that all of these are sort of totally parallel in themselves. So you can use that also to create parts of your shape. And so, and combine these many things together with the Pathfinder and these things, you can really sort of add your synapse to a perfect line and other things. So that's, that's the sort of basis of drawing. There's not much else to it. It's just these things you want to do early on. And once you have done that, this, uh, we'll try to sort of make a cooking program out of this because it may be a bit too boring otherwise. So when you have come to a place where you have done all your tracing, it may look something like this. And then you see that uh, you, I have used this to make this... Uh, so blunt ends on everything like this. And, but blunt ends on those uh, accents that go in that are supposed to come from other places may not look very visually uh, pleasing. So there are two things that you can do to make this look a little bit different. One thing that I like is to make your lines disappear. And originally this was quite difficult to do. You had to create actually the outline of your stroke and go in and modify this yourself. But in newer versions of the Creative Suite, there is actually a great small tool that looks like a C elegance, <laughs> this guy. Um, and it's actually a, it's a great tool to draw a C, a C elegance as well, if you want to. <laughs> um, so if I just try to describe how that tool works. So you have, sorry, I just, I'm not allowed to draw on anything there. I'll just make a new one. So if I draw a, a path, something like, well, if this is supposed to be a seal against, then it shouldn't be that many strokes. So 
So we just make this into a very heavy line, like this. And now you have that tool, this one here, that is the width tool. So you click this tool, and now at every point of this, you can add a thickness variable. So in the center here, I may say that, well, this one should be thicker at this point. So then it, it thickens the line on that point, but not on uh, other places. So it maintains this point as a point of thickness reference. And here I may say that I want to make this thin like that. And on this side, I want to make it also thin. So the beauty of this is that you can make a very sort of uh, biologically um, biosimilar shapes and organic looking things, but it still is maintained as a single path. So you now see when I take this, it has changed the width here, and that's on the thickest point here. So if I say, well, this became a little too thick, I can now make that into 30. And then it just thins all of it out, but maintains this in internal structure. And then you can go in, and I can still edit my shape if I don't like the head of my C elegance here. So, sorry, I can make this a little bit bigger. I can then go in and change that handle, and it moves with you. So it's a very dynamic tool that you can uh, use in all your paths. And why do I think that this can be nice also in the case of our illustration like this, is that it enables you to make endings disappear out of your page. So in this case, I have now a very blunt end of this object here. And what I can go in is then to say, well, here, I want to make sure that I have it disappearing from this point here. I want it to be the same thickness as it was before. Here as well, the same thickness. I just pull these out and make sure that these are my points of reference. And then I say, well, on to this point, then I want this all to disappear. Sorry. So this takes a bit to get used to, because it's not always working in the way you want. And you see that it's <laughs> not doing that for me today. So, but then you can always just play around with it until it sort of hides all of that that you want. So now it has created a line that disappears on this side. But you then see that the filling doesn't disappear, because it's only my line that has disappeared like this. And now we go into the realm of transparencies. And transparencies are very nice when you want to make sure that things disappear, but that you can add other things below it. Because here, you could make just a gradient that goes to white, but then you're locked into this being always on a white background. You may want to change that to have a blue background in your PowerPoint or something like that. And then it's much better to work with transparencies. And transparencies you can consider in two ways. One is to just change the global transparency on each object. And that you do just in the transparency dialog and you change the opacity of your object. So a totally opaque uh, object wouldn't then let through any other data. But if you have it like 40%, then things that you put below, um, if I just put this one below so you can see how that will look, you then have this uh, transparent appearance. However, that doesn't look very nice when actually this synapse is very important in this uh, graph um, or this uh, drawing. So then you want to achieve something where this whole sort of disappears into space. And this is a tool that I must say I use much more than I thought I would use. It's something called the opacity mask. And opacity masks are these sort of extra gradients and objects that you put on top of these objects that you have in here. And they are put in the same transparency dialog. You have 
this uh, opacity mask is called actually and you make it in here so what I did was to select object I want to add this opacity mask to and then go in and make mask so now you see the object is there but you just don't see it <coughs> and this is one of the things where it makes a bit complex to work with opacity mask is that it by default doesn't show anything of your drawing so it makes everything 0% uh, opacity. But then you can go onto that opacity mask. So when I still have this object selected, I can go in and start drawing in this opacity mask. And I can make, the easiest thing is just to make a white box. So you see here that it's, now you have a white box in the op opacity mask, and it just shows the part of your um, drawing that is within that box. And this doesn't look very fancy. Of course, you can achieve that in many different ways as well. But it gives you the option to actually start to play around with gradients. So if you go in here and I pick, sorry, I should be a few there. I pick my standard gradient, which I apparently have lost. So I have to just redo this gradient from shades on back here. Nope. Sorry about that. This one I wanted out. So I just make a normal gradient here again and make that into black gradient to white. And now you see that it actually is starting to take things away on this side. And on the other side, it's 100% showing. So then you can go in and actually make this gradient. It should be a linear gradient that has the other version here, so that you have it going from white to black on this side. So now you can achieve something where these disappears out into space. And it sort of does that in a uh, gradual manner. And then it's, uh, it still is now the full object there. You can, if you go back in the uh, original transparency here, you can still edit the full object just as you would before. I haven't changed anything in that object. But it has this uh, opacity mask that enables this to uh, disappear yeah. into space. So that's, that's something that I recommend you to also play around with once you've gotten your drawing almost done. Because you don't want to start with this too early. You add a lot of ob other objects. Can you copy paste these more complex things also, like opacity mask, so you don't have to redo the... Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing I want to say with that is that the, op the opacity mask moves with the object now. It's locked there. So if I move this object around, it stays the same in re relation to that one. So if I put it somewhere here, it still has that opacity mask. So that, that it moves with it. But you can always also copy it. You just go back to your mask, and I take this mask here, copy it, and I can put it into the next. Sorry, that probably is in another layer. No, I'm just in my opacity mask. Continued. So I select the other one make an opacity mask to that, and then I can paste in the same one. But in that one, you may then want to rotate it, but that's, of course, always a possibility. So with that, you can achieve this type of thing where different things disappear out in different ways, and they don't need to have sort of the same gradient direction or anything like that. So I think we are actually set.